leave. Right. Mm -hmm. I'll have to wait on that doctor's appointment. Okay. Um, well, I want to welcome everybody uh, to Bible study. Sorry, we had some technical difficulties uh, with uh, with my Zoom link, and uh, so I think we're back. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll join us uh, here. We're looking at Scripture for the 16th Sunday of Pentecost, and uh, have a wonderful. A story from Matthew and have some good readings today. So uh, we want to begin with a word of word of prayer. Good and gracious God, we, we give you thanks for your grace, uh, for the reminders that you give us daily uh, that you have claimed us as, as your own in our baptism. Uh, refresh us here with your word and with the conversation that we share uh, here uh, at church and, and through through the folks who are viewing in as well. We ask your blessings upon them. Uh, continue to remind us in this world of the power of your promises for our lives as we uh, deal with, with all kinds of tragedies, um, fires in the West and possible storms coming up to the East Coast and, and other, other things and ways that we need your help and ask for your mercy. Uh, bless us this day and always in your name we pray. Oh man. Yeah, those fires are bad. I, um, I think the smoke is starting to uh, show up here. You can tell with the sunset that uh, sun, the sun the other day was like humongous on the horizon. Right. But, uh, yeah. yeah they, well, they say it's there. They've gotten, the smoke has gotten as far as New York City. Wow! Yeah. So. Well, we blow we blow some smoke in here, uh, <laughs> don't we? Well, so is that on camera? Yeah, but you're not. Um, we have a guest with us who, a mystery man, on the other side of the room. Who wants to remain that way? <laughs> but he's going to offer us some great insight on the scriptures this morning. So we got we have a story from Jonah, and uh, who would like to? Since I'm leaving, dive early, in. I'm leaving early. Can I read it? Sure, I'd love to. Okay. Jonah three verses, uh, verse ten to chapter uh, to four, chapter uh, verse eleven, chapter four, verse eleven. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did, he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah, so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor, in which you did not, did not grow. It came 
into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? That ends the reading. That ends the entire book. <laughs> that ends the entire, the entire uh, of story of Jonah. The, the whole the whole book of Jonah ends with a question. Yeah. Do not know the right hand from the left hand, also many animals. I thought there was Jonah in the way out there. Yeah, there is. This is after. Yep. That's after that. This is after. So Jonah was a prophet who was sent to Nineveh. He refuses, gets swallowed up by this big fish, and spit up on the shore of Nineveh. And still has to uh, still has to figure things out here, and he's still figuring things out. I mean, he's he's focused every he's focused all of his anger on this bush. It's what we call sideways anger. Well, after you've been inside a whale for a while and then spit up on the shore, wouldn't you be kind of uh, a little bit antsy and uh, <laughs> a little yeah. bit vindictive, maybe? Yeah. I think uh, the thing that always gets to me is, uh, yes, angry enough to die. Uh, you know, God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. I mean, how much, how much resentment, how much frustration, how much anger can one man take? And then he just wants to be relieved of all of that. And I guess that's the way Jonah was. I, you know, I think about the year 2020, I can't wait till it's over sometimes. Um, which think, think about the same people. Yeah. Across Across the world, across the world, the same feelings. I know it. Or you know, I mentioned uh, those wildfires because you know people are losing their homes and people are dying. And the devastation that these fires bring, on top of everything else that those poor people have dealt with, yeah. the same things we have been dealing with, and with the threat of earthquakes. Yeah, and then that too. For, that's that's a perennial. They do have a multi-billion dollar stadium though in LA. Have you seen that thing? Uh, billion dollar. Yeah. The LA Rams. I think it's. It was. Yeah, the other night. Yeah. 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 LA Rams played. That's crazy. <laughs> but I don't know. What are your thoughts on uh, Jonah? Well, it. it it fits well with the gospel. I mean, it's a, a, a great pairing for for the gospel story and for Jesus' parable about um, the gracious landlord and landowner. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, you know, and Jonah would rather would rather die in his own anger than you know would choose to die in his own anger uh, rather than um, you know lift up or, or submit himself to God's merciful abundance. Uh, you know, he, yeah. I mean, it, uh, you know, he ends up making it all about him. It's, it's, you know, that's classic. Yeah, it is. It is classic. I mean, it is, um, that it, it, it ends up being all about, all about Jonah and about, um, you know, his right to be angry and his right to want the people of Nineveh to, uh, to be destroyed, and, uh, you know, that, and then 
and he experiences some relief that, and then he gets angry because, you know, the, the relief is temporary. And, uh, you know, how much, how much we get, you know, it's, it's such a human story and that it's, you know, we get caught up in, um, in our own anger, our own resentment, that uh, things, aren't, things aren't turning out the way we would like them to be. I, uh, looking at Jonah, for those of you who are curious about it, I mean, this is a this is a book you could read in just a, just a few minutes. Um, but there's a wonderful prayer in chapter two. Um, in the midst of this entire story is this prayer of thanksgiving and. Chapter two, when Jonah prayed to the Lord in the belly of the fish, I won't read the whole thing, but he just starts out by saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. Um, you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. I, I think it's a great prayer, um, and it it has echoes of, um, obviously it wasn't for Jonah, but it is for us as we think about baptism and, and how God's grace is, is kind of surrounding us in, in the water. <clears throat> uh, as, we, as we call to the Lord in distress, you know, God does answer us. Um, Maybe it's not always the way we anticipated or expected. Sometimes he sends a bush. Uh, and uh, I think we have to, like you were saying, Glenn, get, there's moments when we need to just get over ourselves and let God's grace wash over us. You know, um, I don't know. I just, I love the imagery in Jonah. The Jonah is just such a great, lively story. You know, and, you know that prayer and the line, you know, salvation, salvation belongs to the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, but Jonah gets caught up in his own anger, as, and as I said, his own anger, his own resentment, and uh, would rather uh, would rather die in his anger and in his resentment than he would live in, in God's salvation. Yeah, God saving, <clears throat> God saving grace, God saving mercy. Uh, Have you ever been around anyone who's? Or maybe you're experienced it yourself, or you're just so, so distraught, so angry that you feel like the how out of this, and uh, not that it's not that you feel like you have to die, but you feel like my goodness, what what where's the coming from going to come from? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think as human beings, that's why this is such a such a great story to read because it's a it's a real human experience that Jonah goes through. You could read Jonah and not realize that it's from the Bible. That's true. It's a it's a life story. That's that's exactly right. That'd be kind of fun to uh, to write a modern day Jonah, Jonah story. Novel. There you go. Instead of a fish, though, what would it be? <laughs> a drone. A drone? <laughs> or a clone. Well, have to... well, a whale is pretty uh, it's pretty dramatic. I mean, was Jonah the whale? Was it wasn't Jonah? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. He was. That was 
Yeah, the other, the other piece to this that I find fascinating is uh, chapter 1, verse 17. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've got these echoes of, of crucifixion, resurrection going on through Jonah's experience in this fish. Um, and finally, God speaks to the fish and spits Jonah out. And then Jonah's still in distress, though. That's, that's the problem. Why wouldn't he be? I, well, that's true. Uh, well, and, and uh, uh, I mean, the other piece of, of Jonah that's always so, to me, is so fascinating is that you know, he, he tries to, to run from all the goddess is calling him to do and uh, again because he's it, it, I what always puzzles me about Jonah is is how did Jonah come to have this understanding and this relationship with God that he knew God so well he knew God to be a merciful you know, and, and you know, dealing with people with abundant grace, with abundant love. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, and yet he, when God calls him to share that, when God calls him to share that mercy, to share that grace, he runs from. It. He runs from the calling. He runs from that sense of, you know, this is what God is asking me to do, and um, I may not agree with it. I'm not at, I'm not at a point, and when you think about what the Assyrians did to the, the people of Israel, I mean, there's good reason for his, his anger and his resentment towards the people of, uh, I mean, of America. America. Yeah, or then about the, the, you know, which was the capital city of the the Assyrian Empire, and uh, so yeah, he had uh, he had good reason to hang on to his his anger, yeah, you know, to uh, and and wasn't in a place in. His own forgiveness. Of, of, he wasn't able to be where God was at in that process. Mm -hmm. Any any final thoughts from you, Don? Well, uh, to put this in context, this whole story in context. This was during the during the time that they were in Syria. I mean. Uh, so this was in about 700 before Christ. Yeah. Uh, and Nineveh was the capital of uh, Nahum. Sennacherib made it the capital of Nahum at that time. Mm -hmm. So Nineveh was a principal city on the on the uh, Euphrates, on the Tigris River. Yeah, it says there. So that's that famous area of the Tigris and the Euphrates River in Assyria. 120,000. People. Well, that, that had to be a pretty good sized metropolis at that time. It's about the size of Lincoln. Lincoln? Yeah. yeah. Except on a football Sunday. That Saturday. Is, yeah. Except on a football Saturday. When... Right. <clears throat> well. So, historically, it's, you know, it's more than just a, it's more than just fiction. It's a, it's a, uh, historically, uh, Jonah, even though Jonah's story is you know, short, it's a short uh, chapter. Uh, historically, it's very significant. Mm -hmm. I 
think that's really good background to, to remember for that story. So I might preach on that actually. We'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, Psalm 145, I can read. Or just, we're just uh, focusing in on the first eight verses here. It's a praise psalm uh, attributed to David. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Be a good psalm to sing on mm -hmm. Sunday. Yes. That is a that is a hymn. Mm-hmm. When we talk about abundant goodness, we're we're also kicking off on Sunday a six-week kind of celebration of grace theme, where we I think we need to focus on, as a congregation and as a people on some some hopeful, positive things in the midst of. Uh, this year that we've been dealing with, a year where we haven't been able to have the convenience of coming together real often uh, for worship, but in the midst of in the midst of all of the challenges we face, to see the silver lining, to see the the blessings that have come to come out of this, and I I think this is a good Sunday to kick that off. I mean, the the uh, the readings are just really lent towards reminding us that that God is God does come to us in abundance it's it's I think a lot of times what we choose to acknowledge uh, sometimes we get stuck in our Jonah ways and uh, don't always see the rich the rich grace around us we've had sermons preached here not, not necessarily by you or either one of you, but uh, about abundance versus austerity. Mm -hmm. Glasses half full versus glasses half empty. Mm -hmm. well, be... and, and it's easy to fall from the, right now, the austerity program. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the latest... The latest one for me was uh, Big Ten uh, in the football season, and uh, it's, it was easy to be real, real cynical about how things were being managed at that level. All we wanted was was football, mm -hmm. but uh, they laid out a, a pretty strict uh, medical protocol this morning for playing, and hopefully. Hopefully that can be followed and we can keep keep everybody safe, but I think we we desperately we desperately need football. <laughs> well it'll be interesting to see what that you know, because I mean Big Twelve had, I know they canceled at least two of their yeah. they canceled at least two of their games because of because of COVID and uh, Yeah, I think we are how many more. We just have to realize that the virus is in charge. Um, we're we're not, but I think we can still. I, th I think we can still make it happen. Um, keep keep kids safe and fans safe. Um, yeah, my wife has a a friend, a high school friend who works in the medical profession. She just came down with COVID. And, she has no idea where she got it. Um, she followed all of the rules and it's just a mystery to her. 
mm-hmm. where she where she may may have gotten it. Um, it just happened, and yeah, she's going to be fine, I think. But yeah, it's she's sick. Uh, can't taste anything. Can't smell anything. But uh, doesn't, feel, doesn't feel good, probably. Uh, yeah, a little malaise, and uh, you know she's our age, but you just never know. So we have to be prepared, but life also has to go on to some degree. And it is such a you know the, the whole aspect of. Uh, this virus and, and the different strains of the virus and you know how sick you get depends on which strain of the virus you get, uh, as well as your own your own the health of your own immune system to fight it off. But uh, well, there's just so much we don't know. I mean, it's just yeah, so it's just you know, and that's I that is I think you know when you talk about austerity versus abundant you know, is that there are many people who, when they have, uh, who, who hang on to that sense of austerity instead of, uh, you know, what being called to live in God's abundance, even in the midst of, uh, even in the midst of this this virus, this pandemic that so limits us in terms of what we can do and uh, and how we do it. Uh, I think that's uh, it's it's amazing the the different uh, opportunities we're given to uh, to to help and to be there for people. And we just we just want to focus on. Sometimes I think you know, our, you know, we want to we want to focus on all the things that have been taken from us, rather than <laughs> all all the opportunities we've been given. Well, that's yeah. That's when we get to the gospel. That's what part of that's part of the attitude in the gospel lesson here is yeah. I think you're right. I mean, we can have a wonderful day and at the end of the day, somebody or something, one little negative thing happens and then that's what you tend to focus on, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, I think I think that's human nature too. Mm-hmm. We need to remind ourselves that we're we're better than, than one little negative thing that happened though. Right. Are you, uh, are you heading out? Yes. Okay. Well, good luck with that. Thank hope you. that goes well. Yeah. Stay safe and you take care. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Appreciate your company. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. See you. Enjoy your company. See you Sunday. Bye, Don. Bye. Uh, Philippians 1 21 through 30. I guess it's your turn. So, if, um, for to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about him, absent and hear about you. I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, 
this is evidence of their destruction. Not of your salvation. And this is God's doing. For he graciously, he has graciously granted you the privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you have the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. It's Philippians is uh, um, probably my you know I it isn't as probably isn't as theological deep as deep as Romans and it, and it doesn't have all the uh, the drama <laughs> that you find in in uh, Corinthians, but I I just enjoy this letter uh, this this whole letter you know because mm -hmm. it become it's very obvious how how uh, how paul how much paul loves this congregation this small congregation in Philippi. Uh, and uh, you know it comes out it comes out over and over again in in the brief what five chapters whatever of Philippians and uh, I mean, again it's a very it's a one of the shorter letters um, um, verse 27 I have a note in my Bible the the uh, it says live your life in a man in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ and I, I that seems to me that that's really the heart of, of this section, but the, the word for live your life is one, is one word in Greek and it's a derivative of, of uh, politic. I think the Greek word is politik, politik, politiko or something like that. Um, the word that, that we get polit politics from. Mm -hmm. And the reason he's using that word is because it's a community that he's writing to, but these are, these are citizens of, of uh, Rome and the tension, the tension between living your life as imitators. I mean, this, this whole book really is about how do we live our life imitating, imitating Christ. Uh, but the tension between doing that in the context of the Roman empire and um, how, what is, what does that mean to be a child of God in the midst of, of the world in which we live? And that, that is, I think the heart and soul of, of, of what Paul is saying here. Um, for to me, living is Christ and dying is gain. I mean, what does he mean by that? He means that living in Christ is living through the resurrection. Dying is dying to the things of this world. And so therefore we are gaining the things of God's kingdom. You can't have, you can't have both. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to prefer, which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. Paul's laying out this argument here, uh, uh, for his own for his own life uh, and how he lives it my desire is to depart and be with christ for that, that is far better but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you telling teaching them that yeah you, we still have to live in the context of this um, of this world so i am convinced of this i know that i will remain and continue with all of you for you progress and joy and faith so that I may share abund abundantly. There's that word abundant again in your boasting in Christ Jesus. When I come to you again, um, writing to the, uh, congregation in Philippi, anticipating seeing them again, only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Again, that's that word, pol that politique word so that whether I come 
and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the God. I mean, this is just rich. I mean, I know, you know, it doesn't have the, the wordsmithing that maybe the Romans does, but um, this, is a, this is a real pastoral letter, um, like you said, uh, from Paul, encouraging, basically encouraging this congregation to live, to live, imitate Christ. And he goes on in chapter two, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. And then he goes on to say, be of the same mind. Um, he wants us to be little, little, little Christ's. So, well, and, and believing that that is, is real for us, it is, uh, and, you know, and, that, and that Christ lives in us. Paul doesn't use that language as much as, as some of the other writers do, but particularly John, but, uh, you know, believing that, that Christ lives in us and, uh, and that, that um, living in Christ uh, or, or Christ living in us also means, uh, the, the line I'm always struck by is the last is uh, 29 that where it says that, you know, not only do we have, uh, are we able to believe in Christ? Uh, you know, we know that Christ is in us and, and we are in him. Uh, but that also calls for our suffering. And I think that's, um, you know, that's a piece we don't think much about. And I, you know, I think in the Western, in the Western church, you know, we have lived so, I mean, we've lived millennia or centuries with, with the church being identified with the state. <laughs> I mean, which was not the case here for the Philippians. Mm -hmm. You know, the church was not a part of the Roman Empire at the time that Paul wrote this. They, you know, and, and they were in a very prominent urban center of the Roman Empire. Philippi was one of the uh, predominant uh, centers, uh, cities in the, in the Roman Empire. And so, um, yeah, they would be. You, you meant to say that it, you meant to say that he is writing this. I mean, this is in the Roman Empire, right? Yeah. But I mean, it, it is. But I mean, the church is not a part of, they, they aren't a part of the establishment is what I meant. Oh, sure. That, right. The Holy Roman Empire. Yeah. Yeah. We aren't, you know, uh, it, it, this is, you know, this is uh, 250 years right. before. This is still separation of you know, church uh, and state here. Right. Where um, Constantine you know, makes the church part mm -hmm. of right. the Roman Empire, uh, makes it the official religion of the Roman Empire. For his own uh, convenience. Right. Not for, not because yeah. of anything Paul Any, says. No. And, uh, and so we, uh, so we, take away that sense of, you know, what does it mean to be uh, in that situation where you, um, as a member of the church, uh, it, it may cause, it may cost you something. You may suffer, you may be called to suffer in order to you know, claim to proclaim Christ crucified, to hang Christ risen. Yeah, there's a story that Rick Foss tells when he was bishop of the Eastern North Dakota Synod, and 
it was a stewardship Sunday in one of the churches and some gentleman, one gentleman is complaining that the church, the church is always asking for money, always asking for money. What, you know, what, what is this about? And uh, another, another gentleman told the story of, of his son that, um, you know, as a baby, you know, he cost me plenty. You know, as, as he was growing up and eating him out of house, house and home, he cost me plenty. And he went to college and he cost me a bundle. And then his son died. And the, the gentleman said, and what I wouldn't give to continue to have my son here. And the lesson in that is, um, yeah, the things that we love do cost us dearly. But in that in that cost is some is some huge blessing that we have and you know when i think about when we think about the, the church um you know we're all in this together but yeah it it, it costs us there is a cost mm -hmm. but if we think of it as a cost then we've missed the point um it's it's about sharing our our blessings and giving to god for the sake of of the gospel and sharing the gospel spreading the gospel um like we're doing here today trying to, to uh trying to spread that but yeah and i and i think the same thing you know when jesus was on the cross that you know he loves us so much that he's willing to pay that price of his the suffering and death in order that we um, would would see the power of his salvation and the power of his forgiveness. Um, yeah, it cost him dearly, but how much better off are we for it? Mm -hmm. So we just have a few few minutes left and. Hmm. Okay, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't went back to the clock. So I we, yeah, we, well, we started late because of my inability to figure out Zoom sometimes. But mm. um, Matthew 21 through 16, the laborers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with a laborers for the usual daily wage he sent them into his vineyard when he went out about nine o'clock he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and he said to them you also go into the vineyard and i will pay you whatever is right so they went when he went out again about noon and about three o'clock he did the same and about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around and he said to them why are you standing here idle all day they said to him because no one has hired us he said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. I was getting, I mean, the, um, I'm not sure if I, where I saw it, but I think that this, yeah, this uh, parable is always referred to as, as the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, to me, the, 
what it really is more about is, is the parable of the gracious landlord or the landowner. I mean, that is what the, to me, what the story is truly about is the grace of, uh, you know, because um, what landlord, what, what landowner is going to go out into the marketplace at five o'clock in the, you know, you know, as the day is coming to an end, yeah, looking for laborers. Um, you know, he, it, it says to, you know, this speaks to us of our God that's willing to come, uh, that comes to us in the midst of uh, times when we're not expecting, uh, you know, because I'm sure those laborers that were still in the, in the marketplace, uh, you know, we're sure they were still there, but you no, know, who is going to hire them at the last hour of the day? Mm -hmm. um, they knew, uh, but they didn't go home, you know, they didn't go anywhere because what else, you know, what other hope was there? I yeah, think, I know where to go. Yeah, and it was the same for our story last week too with the with the king. Um, I think if you're looking for a good economics lesson, you don't go to the gospel. Mm -mm. The gospel has upside down economic lessons, <laughs> and and you know it. If if you think that God is a good businessman then you thought wrong because he's willing to, to give what he has uh, without regard for what we think about it. He doesn't care what, he doesn't care how, how we rationalize, you know, they, we've worked longer than they have. So therefore we get more. He doesn't care about that. What he cares about is, is his, his own love and generosity. And, you know, it was the same last week with the, with the wicked slave and forgiveness. And, uh, you know, with a $10 million debt that the, the landowner of the king just wipes out. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't have any regard for what makes good economical sense. It's all about how generous he can be. And I think, I think that's our lesson is that, you know, we, we want to judge others uh, based on, on what we feel is their own merit. merit. Um, but God doesn't see it that way. You know, I, well, I get the one thing I've come, and I shared some of this with you uh, recently too, is, uh, is just, I mean, God has a much clearer picture of the whole, of the whole universe. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and I believe sees us more clearly than we see ourselves. You know, and he sees all of that and he sees the abundance of this universe and all that there is. We see scarcity. Yeah. Or like Don was saying earlier, we see the glass half empty right. instead of half full. And how do we, you know, and, and so uh, we have to die to ourselves in order to, to experience that grace. And I think that's, um, Paul doesn't use it quite in that way, but that's, to me, that's what, when, Paul says to die is, is gain. Yeah, when I die, die to my own selfish interests to live in the abundance of God's mercy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How much that opens up <laughs> all of life for me. Mm -hmm. You know, all of, of, all of what God has to offer. And uh, 
that, and that, you know, I'm, I am much like the, the first, uh, first, uh, laborers, laborers, because I've been in this, you know, my whole 72 years have been in working in the vineyard, <laughs> have been in God's name, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, Am I going to be um, focused on that, uh, you know, and this, or, you know, especially uh, having done two adult baptisms in the last month and thinking, you know, here are people who have, who have not known that, that grace of God you know, are just coming to it now and, and are in a, in a way overwhelmed by it and not sure what to do with it. <laughs> yeah. I, as you were talking, I'm thinking of if, as, as we read this, now from now on, why wouldn't I just show up at five? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why? I mean, what? Why would I show up early in the morning with this guy anymore? I mean, what, I mean, it, so this—that's the other part of this is, you know, what? If I know I'm getting paid the same if I show up at five and do less work, then why wouldn't I nap all day and show up at five? I mean, that's that's the other that's the other piece to this whole to this whole thing. So, what? You know, and I think that's that's one of the uh, critiques of of Lutherans is that we're we believe we're saved by grace through faith, so that we think we don't have to do anything. However, it's what we do after we realize how generous God is to us. You know, that's that's what motivates us, and our motivation is different. Um, our motivation isn't to, we already know we're seen as, as God's children. Um, you know, and, and like these adult, these adults that you baptize, what's, what is, what is motivating them now to live, to live out their baptism? You know, and I think that's, that's the challenge for us is it's not what we have to do. It's what we, what we get to do. And, uh, but yeah, that's, that's one of the pieces to this that, that I'm sure people are, are going to be wrestling with is, well, why wouldn't I just show up at five? I get paid the same. Well, and the, I guess the other, as you're talking about that, the other thing that I think in that is, you know, what, it, uh, again, <laughs> You know that that these first laborers didn't they worked for him and uh, but they didn't really know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and put all their their focus on. Own. what they were doing for him for for the landowner and not seeing what the landowner was doing for them and giving them productive work to do yeah and purpose you know, and meaning and, and purpose and meaning and, yeah and all those things yeah so when you think about persons who are wondering what is <laughs> what is my purpose? What is my meaning? The, the, God has given that given that to us in our baptism, and that I have got to live, you know, live my whole life in that 
in that reality and that I and yes I struggle mightily with that at, at times mm -hmm. but most of that struggle comes out of well why am I not getting rewarded more for the work what I you know I, I think that I should be getting more reward for the work I'm doing mm -hmm. uh, well this is this this is going to be fun to preach I mean if I had to if I had to title my sermon for this Sunday, I, I would title it, Why Not Just Show Up at Five? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and then talk about, you know, what does it mean to live in that relationship with God? What is the benefit of, of showing up at nine instead and, and still being in the field, um, in the vineyard? Um, the vineyard... The vineyard's a rich metaphor for the kingdom of God. Um, and uh, I think to enjoy, if you've been, ever been in a vineyard, just the entire experience of being in, in the midst of all those vines and the grapes, and then the obviously the product that comes out of the fruit of the vine is um, is, is enjoyable as well. But um, you know, you just have this rich metaphor of, of God's kingdom in this, in this parable as well. And, uh, it's, it's hard to not see our Lord as that, as that generous landowner. Uh, so good stewardship, good stewardship text for Sunday. Um, lots of directions like the preacher could go or folks could, um, think about for their own devotional life. And as you talk about that, it's, um, and I was thinking about one, lots of the vineyards now around uh, here at times will allow you to go out and, uh, in fact, invite you to go out and harvest and, and help with the harvest of the grapes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there are, I don't know where we were at. There was actually a vineyard that, you know, would, uh, they would have, uh, they can't do it during COVID now, but they had, the, you know, the big party where you got to, um, the, the, they put you in a big bat and let you stomp the grapes, you know, and, uh, which is what, you know, they don't do that anymore. But uh, I was, I couldn't help but think of the old episode of I Love Lucy where, Lucy is, I don't know if you've ever seen it or not, but it's where Lucy gets, uh, and I forget what the, what the whole situation is, but she gets hired, you know, she ends up in this bat stomping grapes with yes. us, <laughs> with this woman who, who has done it for a lifetime. I mean, she is, she is, you know, and, uh, and, you know, if they get into this big fight to, <laughs> mm. End up, end up in the grapes and the, the juice and all this sort of stuff. But it's that, uh, you know, it is that, that tension that exists between, that exists for us between those who, you know, the, like Lucy, who comes to this whole, comes to this whole job late and <laughs> has never done it before and and now, as a, you know, this woman who's lived it, you know, lived it most of her life and knows what she's doing, um, and, and and how we, you know, we our ego wants to claim credit for that mm -hmm. instead of humbly uh, being grateful for the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. What is that? What does that look like for us? Well, good words, good food for thought uh, this morning, and uh, I guess it is a little bit after 11, 10, 12 after. Okay. Um, close with the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, and just uh, 
I would also, you know, just a reminder to, to Greta. Our thoughts out for Greta, and um, I'm not sure what, I, would, I don't know that, I know that today was going to be the burial, the burial, and then next week is next the week memorial. The memorial service, but being with Greta, she's with her family, and today is the family buries their, their mom and their grandma, and, Come Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.